I think within a year we had 10,000 different order combinations that had already been placed. If someone would get, you know, two of one product, one of the other, and then, you know, two of one product, two of that product, it just kind of became uh, pretty crazy. So, um, and we didn't have like the proper infrastructure in place for tracking a lot of that. So that had to be really like scrounged together and built on the fly while we had this business that was growing so quickly. Um, Chris always had the best analogy for it that I can think of, which was like, we were renovating a house while there's a party going on. You know, there's, <laughs> there's people drinking in one room, they're tracking paint all through the living room. Um, so there was a lot to navigate. Um, it was really interesting experience those first couple of months, especially um, when it all kicked off and was going crazy. Hello, everyone. Coming at you live in the Ad Buyers Group, Tim Bird's amazing Ad Buyers Group, uh, one of my favorite Facebook groups out there. Uh, welcome to season two of The Robust Marketer. This is uh, basically the start, yeah, the, the start of my second season, let's call it. I think it's episode 40 something. Um, but I wanted to start hosting these podcasts uh, live. And actually, you know, usually we don't usually do a lot of editing. There's not very much, uh, you know, not, not much that we add to these interviews. Uh, but, uh, but I wanted to try doing this live, seeing how it's, how it's going. So for the first several interviews that we're going to do uh, in season two, we're going to host them in friends of mine groups. Uh, so if we're starting in the ad buyers group, we're going to go to Ecom empires next week, um, and do a podcast there as well. We'll still be releasing these as, um, regular podcasts on YouTube, iTunes, and Google play. But for now, uh, we are happy to be trying these live. So it's a, so it's a cool experiment. So I'm just using be live actually for the first time. Uh, and we've already got questions. We've got live comments here. Uh, am I currently in Toronto is one of the questions. No, I am not. Uh, I'm in Victoria, British Columbia. Um, but Alex and I, who is my guest today, share a Toronto connection. Um, so let's, I, I just wanted to start with a little preamble here. Um, the first, the first thing I want to let you know that's going on with season two of the robust marketer is we're going to focus exclusively on, uh, speakers and, uh, entrepreneurs and marketers who we're actually working with in our upcoming live events. So this is the first series of our e-commerce mastery live Asia uh, tour where we're going to start with Alex Brown. I'll tell you a little bit more about him in a second. So um, Alex and I met online a little while ago. We got introduced through a friend uh, and I could just sort of, t I, there was a real kindred spirit thing going on here. Alex Brown is co-founder of the Beard Club, which is an eight figure subscription e-commerce juggernaut. Um, and he is doing all sorts of other cool things. Uh, regarding teaching entrepreneurs really how to build incredible brands, um, build incredibly loyal tribes, and build incredible e-commerce businesses related or not to the subscription model. But that's a lot of where his expertise really resides. Um, so if you have questions for us, if you want to know about e-commerce mastery live, which happens on December 7th uh, in Bangkok, Thailand, if you aren't coming, you should really consider a trip to Southeast Asia. Uh, to join us there for this amazing training event. If you have any questions about the event, if you have any questions as we go uh, through this interview in this li new live format, we can uh, certainly uh, address them. So, so we'll go through that. So welcome to the Robust Marketer, Alex. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no worries. I was saying your, your, your beard is well up to the, to the club <laughs> moniker. Uh, I so took, I think uh, that's, that's fantastic. I took quite a bit of it off. It was, it was pretty big and... Uh, getting a bit unruly and decided to freshen things up and change things up a little bit for summer, but getting a little colder now for winter in some parts of the, of the world anyway. So maybe it's time to grow back out again. Nice. Well, we'll see. We'll have to see it. You have to be fresh for Bangkok, but, but they exactly. do, they do love a good beard over, over there in Bangkok as well. Cause they don't grow them very well for right. themselves generally. <laughs> um, but why don't we start with a little bit of an overview of your marketer hero's journey. Tell us a little bit about uh, what you're doing today and, and how you got there. Um, so I actually, you know, like you'd said, uh, kinder Canadian spirits, I grew up close to Toronto, Ontario, up in Canada and, um, went to school to, uh, hopefully get a corporate job. But, um, you know, I didn't actually want to be an entrepreneur, just sort of ended up that way. I had a construction business, um, cause my dad was into it. So, um, I put myself through school being an entrepreneur, but just wanted to get like, you know, I thought the world owed me an amazing job. If I got a degree, that was not the case, uh, graduated during the last big recession. So big slap in the face there and kind of turned back to entrepreneurship um, and started to get involved in the startup scene and just kind of like, you know, volunteer and 
you know, do whatever I could to get involved with startups uh, because nobody would hire anyone that had a degree of no experience. Um, and so kind of did a bunch of different things in that space. Um, a lot of stuff helping other entrepreneurs and kind of lobbying the government for entrepreneurship support up in Canada. And then, um, you know, one thing led to another. I got connected with Chris, my business partner from Beard Club. Um, and he was in California at the time. He's another Canadian boy. And um, I'm really, uh, you know, have been really good at operations and kind of taking a big idea and putting it into systematic steps that can at least get things rolling. And um, after that can be adjusted. And Chris is a super creative, um, unbelievably, up, you know, pie in the sky sort of uh, creative guy. So we worked really well together and um, hit it off. And so I moved to California four years ago. And we started doing kind of Kickstarters and Indiegogo campaigns and trying to launch products and just basically trying to sell anything we could. We had a wearables product, we had a golf product, and we'd kind of do a Kickstarter, ship the product, and then figure out, you know, we didn't really want to be in that market or the opportunity wasn't really there, something that we weren't really passionate about. But we got this kind of knack for branding something and um, creating a campaign that people would share and get after and um, be interested in. So people started asking us to do it for them. So that's what we did. We kind of started an agency as a lot of people do. Um, so we were shooting videos and building websites and helping people launch products. Um, and at that point, we launched another product of our own called Coolbox, which did really well in Indiegogo. It's like a smart tech toolbox with lights and speakers and a battery and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and did really well, half a million dollars in Indiegogo. Um, and that just helped our network you know, expand tremendously. Landed my business partner, Chris, on Shark Tank. Um, so, you know, just for us, it was a tremendous learning experience. Um, would love to say that we made some money, but, uh, haven't really seen much of that yet. Um, but we've actually were able to license the product out to a company who is now taking it to market, um, and doing quite well with it. They're rebranding it, taking it out as a cooler. So it's cool to see you be able to pass that off and, um, uh, give it to a company that can really take it and make it large and a lot of big box stores. Um, and that kind of freed up some of our time. So we started the beard club, which was uh, started as dollar beard club and really kind of like an organic fun business. It was, um, we never really expected it to do so well, but it was just sort of a fun thing that we thought about. We all had beards at that time, um, attracted a couple more, uh, co-founders into the mix, people who could do creative work, um, and operations and stuff. So, um, we started using beard products. We were all growing beards, using natural products, getting into holistic health and stuff like that. But all the beard oils out there were like 20 bucks and, full of crap that we didn't want to put on our face. Um, so we kind of just saw the opportunity to slide in there and did what Dollar Shave Club did um, with a different spin on it. And um, it just went incredibly well. Well, we took everything we learned from all these other sort of, um, you know, stumbles and failures and half successes and um, applied it to, you know, actually building a, a bit of a list, um, creating an awesome video and just pressing launch. And from there, um, it just went absolutely crazy. We were able to hit all like the major press outlets in the first couple of days. We all of a sudden had this like high growth company um, without the experience of you know how to run a high growth e-commerce company. So it was just accelerated learning galore, um, had to increase our team, um, had no standard operating procedures in place. So, um, you know, all these are great problems to have. And I'm certainly not complaining. I'm grateful for all the struggles. But um, it wasn't an overnight success because we had all these other experiences and it wasn't without its issues. Um, I think uh, what the really cool part about it, though, was that we just kind of latched onto this underlying current. I don't know if you've ever seen it when a guy with a giant beard walks into the room. There's another guy with a giant beard. They kind of do this like motorcycle wave. They're like, hey, man, what's up? You know, um, <laughs> yeah. so we we tapped into this kind of club that was already there between people and this vibe and just figured out how to I don't want to say exploit it, but just play into that and create really funny videos um, that would go viral and that people wanted to share. And, you know, it's something that someone would tag their friend, like they don't even have a beard or a woman would tag their boyfriend or their brother because he has a beard. Like, you got to see this. This is about beards and stuff like that. So um, that's why it resonated so well with so many people um, and got us to that kind of viral launch point uh, where we could kind of learn and, and figure out how to create an actual scalable business and manageable business instead of one that was just kind of built on sensationalism. So yeah, that was, was a crazy wild ride. <laughs> or just uh, it's it also you did it you did a reverse approach that a lot of the new entrepreneurs getting into e-commerce do where it's like you find a product that you may or may not believe in that you think that there's a market for it, and then you hammer it with ads until you see a response and then and then you can scale it from there whereas right. you guys like yours was more like surfing in a way right like you took you tapped totally. into this giant force 
and kind of just let it roll, which, but you, but you had to align all of the pieces in order to, to, to get caught up in that wave and, you know, as yeah. authentic essentially. So talk yeah. a little bit about what you did to really like, well, it's, in, it's in, another thing you did that's interesting is you didn't like, uh, you, you, you did something that was personally interesting and that you're, that you like a lot of people don't mean, may not advocate jumping into a niche that, that you embody or that, that you're really into, but you guys, you guys did exactly that. You, you, you made a product that you guys would want as, you know, as consumers yeah. and then, and then tapped into it. What are, what were some of the ways that you tapped into it to, to, to have it come across so authentic and, and, and have such viral, you know, takeoff? I think, um, I think, like I said, we, we made products or like you said, we made products that we actually wanted to use. Um, and you know, maybe part of it was us doing it so we could have free beard products. Um, but you know, the, the marketing itself was all based on like trying to make people laugh and smile and share it with their friends. And at that point we were really completely inexperienced at direct response marketing and, you know, Facebook advertising. We had a team member who was good at building an audience and helping us with that. Um, but creating a sales funnel was like, we thought funnels were what we use for beer. Um, and so until we started going out to some of like the events in the industry, like traveling conversion and, you know, being introduced to the mastermind scene, we had the skill set for building a brand and affinity around videos that we were able to share with people. And then they were like, dude, you guys need to build like a proper email list. And so um, it was kind of a cool give and take scenario, but yeah, it just, it started with authenticity and, and videos that we would laugh at and want to watch and products that we would want to wear. Very cool. So now did it start right away as a singular subscription where you'd get, where you'd get a different thing each month? Is that how it began and, and what it, it always was? So it started as a fully customizable box. Um, and that was, you know, something that we had to develop over time. We had a ton of web issues, like ridiculous web issues, which we finally sorted out. But um, we built on kind of a custom platform. At this time, you know, Shopify wasn't where it is and WooCommerce weren't, wasn't where it is in terms of offering like, you know, an out of the box solution that's a little more dynamic. So we built a custom solution with nine different SKUs that people would just kind of go through, you know, four or five step checkout process where they'd see oils and then they would see balm and wax and then shampoo and stuff. So um, we would obviously have drop off through all of these. Um, and eventually we were able to come out with a kit to make it really simple, like a one click sort of buy. But it's always just been, you know, you pick the products you want and then go in and customize it or change it or cancel it as it is. So um, it's just been always, you know, very dynamic. And it just always flexed. If someone could get a hundred dollar a month box, if they wanted it just by hammering on the goods. Yeah, yeah it, it made for a very complicated data scenario because, you know, we would have, I think within a year we had 10,000 different order combinations that had already been placed. If someone would get, you know, two of one product, one of the other, and then, you know, two of one product, two of that product, it just kind of became uh, pretty crazy. So, um, and we didn't have like the proper infrastructure in place for tracking a lot of that. So, that had to be really like scrounged together and built on the fly while we had this business that was growing so quickly. Um, Chris always had the best analogy for it that I can think of, which was like we were renovating a house while there's a party going on. You know, there's, <laughs> there's people drinking in one room, they're tracking paint all through the living room. Um, so, there was a lot to navigate. Um, it was a really interesting experience those first couple of months, especially um, when it all kicked off and was going crazy. I was just talking with someone in fulfillment today and they were, cause I have, I've actually never worked with a fulfillment center personally. And they were talking about the, the, you know, the more complex your, your order is, the more, you know, the more variations you can have between things, the more the fulfillment cost will be. What did you guys do in the early days of filling? Were you doing it yourselves or did you guys work with a fulfillment center early? So we initially worked with kind of a mom and pop shop, almost operation. Um, they had some good warehouse management software, but it was not cap uh, compatible with our website. Um, and they simply couldn't keep up. So it created a ton of issues. We were missing a ton of shipments. Um, the inventory counts were completely whack. So we started with an outsourced solution, but right away they became sort of obsolete and we had to on the fly scale up inventory at a whole new place and go over there. Um, and yeah, like you said, it becomes typically when you have multiple products, if they're able to create kits ahead of time. Um, and that's what we did with, you know, there was, I think, 10 or eight or 10 really common combinations of products people are ordering. So being able to kind of pre-kit those, we, we have a custom box that they would build, the shipping box. So there's kind of a lot to the fulfillment process and a full-on assembly line that they have to kind of work with. So if you're able to kind of pre-kit things, so they just lick and stick a stamp. Um, it's much more cost effective and keep things down. So 
Um, you know, it took us a while to kind of work to that. And we didn't have the data on what would be those popular combinations at first. It took a little while to shake that out um, and kind of like introduce a couple new products and see how they did and uh, shave a few off that weren't doing so well. Very cool. It's it's a really interesting model. Like, and I and I've, I've actually talked to a number of people lately who are really, you know, you guys saying how you went, you got press. So you, so you, 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 you know, you, you, you got press when you launched. Well, sorry, was the press for the cool box or was the press for the beard club? So there was there was both kind of um, at the same, well, around the same time. So we had a couple of press connections that we were able to tap on the shoulder, but most of our press actually came from um, people just loved our initial video and it just went on Reddit and then it got upvoted like crazy. So a ton of people saw it on Reddit and then it got put on product hunt, not by us. Like, so a lot of this was done organically and we kind of realized that this was a huge part of our formula that probably if we tried to do it ourselves, couldn't replicate. Um, it's really hard to force, um, like something going viral and mm -hmm. create that sort of recipe. So, um, we were really fortunate that it did resonate so well with people that they went and, you know, put it on product hunt, put it on Reddit. And from those two sources, I mean, that's, or I think 90% of our media coverage came from us, those two. Amazing. And that, and how long was the halo effect on that? Was that like a week or two weeks? Like when you launched so, or like how, how, yeah. How long did you feel the residual hit from that? That was like the initial real push was probably three weeks. Um, and then after that things sort of died down. But by that time, you know, our next objective was to launch in Canada. We started in the U.S. and we're a bunch of Canadian dudes. We're like, hey, we got to launch in Canada. So, you know, we started working on our second video. Um, and that was to launch like the um, launch the Canadian market. And then we were able to kind of tap all the same people on the shoulder. You know, some of them were interested. Some of them were not. Um, but it becomes more and more difficult to like, hey, this is Dollar Beard Club's 10th video. Let's, you know, see if the press is interested. Like there really has to be a story mm -hmm. around it. So we would try and position it with different like things like, hey, you know, this is kind of the revenue that we did. And this is sort of like a really weird unicorn situation where we're selling like, you know, novelty cosmetics for men, but doing really well and growing. So, you know, as long as we were able to package things up, we can kind of continue to, to see that media attention. And, um, and to be honest, we were, I wouldn't say we were dependent upon it, but like that was a huge part of our early growth until we really um, understood a lot of our metrics and analytics and were able to you know, get our website to a point where we could start buying media more effectively instead of just kind of throwing money out there and promoting videos and hoping that it was doing well, just to be able to attribute sales properly to those ads and, um, you know, have a more like, I guess you'd say like responsibly scalable business instead of one that was just kind of built on like, you know, the media pushes. Um, another thing that did really well for us was influencer marketing. Um, that helped the snowball. I'm sure that got us on Reddit um, and product hunt as well. Um, we had a number of different influencers that posted for us. Um, two of our advisors, Dan Fleischman and Brandon Hampton, were um, really big. Or they still are really big in the influencer world. They built a ton of influential accounts and helped other influencers build those accounts. So um, they facilitated a lot of really great shares for us on that. Um, and then about three months in, my business partner, Chris, was talking to Dan Bilzerian, um, who's just a big great beard. Instagram influencer. Yeah, great beard. Um, very um, divisive guy, I guess you would say, uh, or somebody who divides the the nation in half. Sometimes you either um, love him or hate him, or hate to love him or love to hate him. But um, he was really excited by it and just kind of contacted Chris and was like, "Hey, I'd really like to invest in this. You know, we, you can leverage my following, which at the time was, you know, only about like twelve million. Now he's got like twenty five. Um, so he came on as an early investor, and really at that point we needed a bit of cash injected into the business because we needed to catch up for you know, our, on our inventory and be able to, you know, create things ahead of time. It took about six weeks for our products to be manufactured. So um, if you stock out and it's still three weeks out, it's big trouble. Um, so that, that cash helped us a lot in that respect and his following, um, whenever he'd share a video initially, it'd just go crazy. And, you know, we'd see thousands of signups and within a couple of days. That's unreal. I, I wanted to talk about Reddit. It's like Reddit is one of the biggest forces in the modern media. Uh, I think, you know, I was reading a headline that said like, you know, a headline on Reddit gets like a hundred times more eyeballs than, than a top CNN story at this point. Like Reddit is just this huge, huge force, but at the same time, they're so skeptical of consumerism in a way that it's yeah. like, it has to be an organic experience for it to, for it to go viral there at all. You, would you agree? Absolutely. And I, <laughs> we, we tried to do the same thing again and, um, you know, sort of created a contest around like, hey, you know, vote like we, we did a video launch. We're like, hey, upload it on Reddit and you can win this and stuff. 
and not really like in, in a position, I'm sure there's Redditors watching this that probably hate me for confessing this, but we didn't do it out of like a place of like, hey, let's try and cheat the system. We're like, hey, like maybe this is a cool avenue and like a cool way for more people to see our video. We had no idea if it was going to work. And, you know, the community found out about it. They're a tight knit community. And, um, you know, we kind of got kicked in the butt for that one. And uh, so that was taken down. And then we weren't allowed to post anything for a bit. And everything is good with Reddit. But yeah, it's the front page of the internet. And it's, um, you know, it's a really well, I don't want to say controlled community, but a really well put together community of people that care about the integrity of the mm -hmm. community. So, and, you know, that, like I said, that's kind of living proof of, of trying to force something. Um, you know, we didn't realize it was unethical, but I guess it was. Um, and it, it just sort of, uh, there, there are ways to more tastefully do it, I guess. Um, and to, I guess to have a presence on Reddit, um, without kind of like, you know, stepping on anyone's toes and doing it improperly. But, um, yeah, we learned our lesson on that one. It was a slap on the wrist. We're like, damn. <laughs> we thought we had this formula so down for any for any redditors out there i'm really sorry if we didn't know what we were doing uh, we won't do it again <laughs> yeah well, it'll be much slyer next time sorry not sorry till you find a better method yeah uh, of making it happen like all good marketers i wanted to yeah. talk a little bit more about the early days of the beard club when you started spending on facebook and you were still having this halo effect of these of these you know you weren't attributing things properly you were still getting lots of signups from your media things and then like Basically, like, what were the steps that you took early on to get your hands around like hardcore CPA marketing? Was that your job within the organization, or did you have someone else? No, that wasn't my job. I've sort of been the jack of all trades in the organization. Um, one of our early partners, Kyle, was was heading Facebook, and we also had like a number of our teammates kind of like working on it. And then we, you know, we sent them and um, in, out to get some training, basically from some really good folks, because we just realized that we needed to, uh, you know, get our chops up more or less. Um, and understood, you know, the basics of retargeting and lookalike audiences and stuff like that. Um, but really like we were kind of, um, kind of had our hands tied behind our back for a lot of the performance marketing stuff, um, because our website was in such dire straits. Um, so it, until we figured that out, which took a while, um, you know, we weren't as effective as we could have been, but kind of piecing together kind of all these different tactics allowed us to get that understanding where it needed to be a little more. So your website was a mess in terms of it not being optimized for conversion, essentially. It was just your first stab at throwing up a website and it just, yeah, yeah that's basically it. was it. like the, the multiple step thing I was telling you about was not optimized for conversion because there's drop off at each step. Um, but there were like, you know, we, we, we couldn't rapidly test different subject lines and different, or not different subject lines, but like positioning of buttons and stuff. Um, like it was a very kind of rigid setup. So we mm -hmm. weren't able to test and optimize very easily. Um, you know, our tracking would kind of routinely break. So we would have to make sure that we were like, you know, change one thing on one part of the website, something else would break. It was just this crazy like spaghetti infrastructure. Um, and there's a lot of technical debt that um, we had a couple different um, CTOs take over and like help get us to the next kind of level and stuff like that. Again, great problems to have. Um, but you, it's kind of one of those things like, oh, why aren't we just like on Shopify or something like that? Um, but at the time it wasn't really possible for us. Well, you were partying. It was a, it was a 24 seven <laughs> party at the time. Uh, no, and you're trying a, to keep the house together. It was, a, it was a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All the best parties are, uh, I want So investment. You took, you took a little bit of money with Dan Bolzerian, which is a really great example of when to take money. I'd imagine like, even though it was to help with, with, I've heard sort of taking money for inventory is not usually a good play unless it benefits you in other ways where this Dan Bilzerian, you know, was a gift that kept on giving, I guess, because you, you yeah. got this locked in, you got the cash that you needed and you got this lot, like the best influencer for you guys probably in the world at that yeah. time. Yeah. It opened a ton of doors for us too, and, and created a lot of credibility where we were able to approach other influencers kind of with him in our back pocket. So yeah, it was, it was, smart money, as they would say, um, in that respect, there was a huge upside to having him on the cap table. Very cool. So, so if we're talking about when you guys really started figuring out Facebook ads about how long ago would that have been now, like about two years ago? So we launched just over three years ago. Um, and the whole like, you know, as everyone in this group knows, the whole process is continuous experimentation and reinvention. Um, but I mean, for the first, I would say really like five, six months was really difficult for us to accurately market on Facebook. Um, another kind of big milestone for us about 
it was just over a year in, uh, we took another small chunk of money to take part in the 500 Startups Advanced Accelerator Program that they ran in LA, the Distro Dojo. So um, we didn't necessarily need the money. Um, it helped with some some acquisition and stuff like that. But we really wanted to get into the networks that they had. And we went into this sort of like boot camp, like VC style boot camp and learned a ton about like growth hacking and, you know, got to sit down at the table with Sean Ellis, who wrote Growth Hacking, the book, um, you know, talked to all these amazing, amazing mentors and just kind of built a huge part of our network from that, too. So um, that really helped us kind of get to the next level in terms of Facebook marketing um, and just, you know, traffic and conversion and everything. Very cool. So uh, we won't go into too much detail on it because it's what your talk in Bangkok is going to be all about. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about turning customers into a tribe or really like how important the customer service aspect is to the, to the, to, to an e to e-commerce success. It's not something, you know, everyone knows you need to have good customer service at this point, but it's kind of something mm -hmm. that's sort of glossed over. I think a lot of people ignore it. What are your thoughts on sort of how to put like, customer service at the top of your sort of value chain? I mean, so like we, we sort of had a bit of a, a journey with this as well. Like I mentioned, we had a lot of filming issues in the beginning, website issues, um, where people were being double charged or skipped orders and stuff like that. So, you know, we had a lot of customer service issues in the beginning. Um, and because we went so big, so quick, people were like, holding us to the standard of this big company where we were just, you know, a bunch of guys trying to figure it out doing our best. So we had to kind of create this level of transparency about that. Um, and at the time, we were looking at customer service like a cost center um, and just like, oh, you know, we have to talk to these members and, you know, we have to make sure that they're happy. But it was never like a priority. Um, we really like we struggled initially with retention as well uh, for a number of reasons, like product offering, um, like order frequency, um, but also just kind of making people feel like they're a part of something bigger than themselves in the club. Like that was the reason that we were able to bring people in. But once they purchased something, that was kind of where it ended. Um, and really, at kind of a, a transitional point, there's a couple of members that got our logo tattooed on them. And there's like four people now that have a Beard Club logo tattooed. So we're like, yeah, this is really cool. Um, and, you know, we sent them a ton of free product and, and talked to them. And, and uh, it kind of occurred to me, like, months later, I was just like, hey, like, why, why did you do that? You know, why, why'd you go and get our logo tattooed? And he's like, honestly, like, um, I'm a really shy guy and it's tough for me to go out and talk to new people and, you know, don't have a lot of self-confidence, but I use your products. It makes me feel like I'm worth taking care of. And it gives me an excuse to like, go talk to that other bearded guy and, you know, like make a new friend or just kind of break out of this social anxiety thing I have going on. And, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm part of something that's, you know, a club and something bigger. And, you know, at that point, I'm just like, man, we're not really selling beard oil and, um, I think this is a huge disconnect a lot of people have in e-commerce is the disconnect of what they're really selling. You know, um, we we're selling like confidence and belonging and that's what people were, that's what people were buying. Right. So we were completely misaligned with that. And it was a, kind of a huge wake up call for us to really reprioritize uh, retention and really reprioritize uh, creating like an actual membership experience that people um, truly enjoy and, and then want to advocate for. Um, Another huge um, a book that I really love that came out, I think it was earlier this year, called Never Lose a Customer Again by Joey Coleman. Have you heard of that? Okay. I haven't, no. It is, you got to get it, man. It's a fantastic book. It's one of my favorite. I probably sold like 500 copies for Joey right now. I haven't met him in person, but I've met him on, online. But um, it's just absolutely phenomenal and just kind of goes through the process of, you know, how to take a customer and turn them into an advocate over this like kind of 100-day process. And one of the most startling things that he says in like the introduction is if you can reduce churn by 5%, you can increase your profit, like your bottom line profit, um, 25 to 100%, right? So just those customers that you already have in your back pocket, you know, to keep them on, you know, a couple more months or whatever that is by just really making them happy, feel like a part of your tribe, um, you can just do absolute wonders for your business. You think about like if every one of your customers and you know your business that you have right now went and brought one of their friends, you would double your business overnight, right? Yeah. So it's just really prioritizing like that tribe that people want to be a part of and serving them with the what they're actually buying, the experience that they truly want from your products um, is so incredibly important and something that we learned, you know, like like a lot of lessons uh, the hard way in in not really truly understanding that. 
I wanted to ask your, uh, yeah, so you've got, you're, you're building this tribe. What, what were, here's just a specific question. This is something I'm interested in because we're with ISAC training, we're sending out mainly emails around the products that we're offering and the things that we're, that we're doing. But in order to really have an engaged list and build that sense of community, you really have to be sending a lot of non-commercial emails, I feel like. Is that something that you guys did? Did you guys work on sending content that was non-salesy to people along with sales emails? Yeah. And along with that was like sort of onboarding and, and for people that were purchasing, you know, like getting them to be a part of the club and, and understanding. But um, that's initially you know, the bulk of the content we were creating wasn't really acquisition focused. It was just sort of like brand building focused. Um, and then, you know, we sort of went all the way in that direction to the point where we were kind of doing over the top videos and it wasn't really resonating anymore. And we realized we had to kind of step back a bit, do brand building videos and stuff that people just enjoyed and engage with and, you know, would open their email to see, but also, you know, ads that we could run on Facebook for the specific purpose of getting them to try our new growth kit, you know? So, um, still is something that does really well for us just like you know memes and engaging funny content so we try and do that as much as we can um while also still being like hey maybe you should buy some beard products every now and again what are you seeing with the beard trend overall right now it's i it's like that you've you've trimmed your beard i gotta say mm -hmm. i've just i trimmed my beard today i guess good grooming is a good is a good idea anyways but what overall are you are, are, are people getting, are, are people wearing thin on beards at this point? Are people just longing for the days of, of clean shaven men? I think, um, I think th that's a great question. Um, but first of all, shaving is a trend because naturally you have a beard. Um, yes, but good point. other than that, that canned answer, which I always love to give, um, I think like, you know, it was certainly more prominent to have a great big beard. Um, I would say probably like a year ago or two years ago when we launched, especially it was huge. Um, but we adjusted our strategy anyways, like everyone with a big beard knew about us anyways. And we realized that that was a really small part of the market. Whereas someone like you with a trim beard, someone like me with a trim beard, um, that's a much more um, address, like a much larger addressable market, right? So to say the beard trend is going away, if it is or not, is kind of irrelevant. You know, like we were focused on providing guys who grow facial hair, which is everyone, whether you have two or 700,000 on your face, um, it's something that unites all men. Um, and so it, to us, it really doesn't matter. It's, it's kind of like been this evolution of our company in general being like, oh, we, we shouldn't focus so much on this. Like, you don't have a beard, screw you, man. You're not part of our club. And to being like, hey, like, we're all men. We're all in this together. Like, let's talk about this. And, and kind of like less about the, the guns and girls marketing and more about the like, you know, let's stick together and take care of ourselves and take care of each other sort of marketing. What a great message for for modern men as well, right? Like it's it's cool to take such a uh, an aspect of masculinity that has traditionally been associated with you know badass guns or whatever, girls, bikinis, beers, and all that, and to really focus around self care. That's what I keep hearing from you as well is this idea yeah. of you know taking care of my beard. Even just recently, I started a skin regimen. I started like I have like a I, like I moisturize in the morning, and it's just and it is it's this yeah. aspect of like ritual but also this concept of like i'm i'm worth taking care of and i'm yeah. not getting any younger yeah well i mean it's just sort of the it's kind of a sign of the times and it's you know you're not any more or less of a man if you're putting on face cream like that doesn't really matter anymore it's 2018 uh, like all is good there you know there's so much out there right now that exists to to divide people um and there's a lot of people that seem to just like enjoy doing that um so we think it's really cool to be involved in something that brings people together. Um, and we changed, like I said, we changed a lot of our marketing. There's a lot of campaigns now, like just kind of following um, and just like exposing lifestyles of different guys. And, you know, it's called beard yourself um, and just kind of encouraging guys to, to be themselves. Um, I don't know. That sounds kind of flaky, but um, just one of our campaigns that seems to do really well because um, we're tapping into that original, um, ethos that we started the company out of authenticity of like us being natural and, you know, wanting to take care of ourselves. We all of a sudden got caught up in the sensationalism and, you know, guns and girls and stuff. And like, that's still sells, I'm sure, and still does well. Um, but for us, we wanted to kind of go back to the roots of where it really started, um, incorporate the funny stuff, but also, you know, be a voice for good. Um, and it's great. We were really good friends with a couple of our competitors too, um, always bearded. I'm not sure if you know the guys from that, like Spencer and them. Um, they do really well. They build community just as well as we do. They do 
all sorts of stuff even better than we do. And it's cool to like, you know, I'll be seeing them next week when I'm in Arizona. It's cool to like just talk to them about the industry um, and be able to have open conversations, you know, as competitors, but like friendly competitors. And when you're in something that is still a relatively new category, uh, it's in your best interest to figure out ways to expand that category together. And it's kind of like, a, you know, a bigger mindset than like, I'm going to steal your customer and you're going to steal my customer. It's like, hey, how do we go double the market size? And we both double our businesses, you know? You're, yeah, you're both innovating. You're both, you know, in the, this sort of unicorn model of going direct to consumer with this tribe building approach. And there's, yeah, and there's a lot of men with beards out there to go around. Um, do you know, do you know Van Oaks from Diesel Sellers and Diesel Brothers? No, I don't. Yeah, you will. He's one of the speakers at e-commerce mastery live as well. And they, they do a lot, you, you know, you'll have another opportunity to talk with people in that market. They, uh, they've got a really interesting market and a lot of stuff around, around beard and, and he's got the best mustache you'll ever see. He's got one of those <laughs> sweet carnival mustaches. I could never, I could never get like the, I could get a little bit of a twist, but my mustache just, I don't know. I never lived up a, a style. I really love is like the short beard, but the big mustache. Ah, uh, yeah, like yeah. Like a 1920s boxer sort of guy. <laughs> I like, yeah, I think, well, that's my new subscription market. I'm just going to go headlock to giant mustache, small beards. So what do you, so if you're like, let's just talk subscription for a second here. Like what is that, is that a model? Like it's such an attractive model, obviously. Anytime you can work on a model that, that has this built-in reoccurring revenue stream as a, as an option, it's going to be a, you know, a valuable thing. Do you feel like subscription for people kind of doing e-commerce right now, maybe they're doing, let's say it's someone who's, who's had some success drop shipping or, or building a more, more general stores or something like that. Do you, do you strongly advocate for the model of, of trying to build out subscription based things? Um, I would probably say it, it depends on the situation. I think there's too many people that want to start a dollar or something club, you know, mm. with, with no real value proposition other than it. like, it's really convenient that you don't have to go and order online every month. Like that's not really a value proposition. I think that there's a lot of great, um, highly consumable products that work really great on a subscription model. Um, but you know, saving like two dollars a month and having something delivered to your door is not that huge of a convenience. Um, I think that there's a lot of creative ways you can do it, and we're certainly going to see subscription e-commerce continue to explode and continue to blow up. But I don't think it's something that everyone should just be like, yeah, we're just going to start on subscription and everyone's going to take the subscription. Um, I think even with us, it's taken a lot of fiddling around to figure out that, you know, the retention plays and like the product sizing and like, you know, is it more cost effective just to send somebody a box every three months instead of every one month? Um, there's a lot of challenging questions like that, especially when you're shipping physical product because um, it gets quite expensive. Yeah. And what I'm hearing is that you Amazon can't too, right? Like they want stuff there in like two days for free. And we're like, yep wow, this is going to take us a while and it's not going to be free, you know? So there's, there's a lot of different challenges too when you're doing yourself off of Amazon. Um, yeah, it's, not, it's something a lot of people don't consider. <laughs> yeah, with, with Amazon in the room too, and I think what I heard you say as well is it's like you can't, no one's going to join a club for $2 off a month. You know what right. I mean? It can't be just about that monetary thing. You've got to have exactly. that underlying sort of like philosophical underpinning of why you're, you're part of this. And I get, I think that's, what you'll talk about a lot in Bangkok are the actual sort of like tactics that you put into place to start fostering that community. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's certainly, it's, it's more than just selling products. And like I said, that's kind of where we hit a dead end where we're like, Hey, our, our club is transactional right now. Uh, we need to do a lot more to actually provide value to people. And, you know, I like to call it um, residual influence when you capture like the, the attention, trust, and loyalty of your customers. And it's kind of a, about looking at retention on a longer timeline instead of just, you know, how do we get three boxes instead of two? It's how do we talk to them for the next year and build up, you know, this loyalty with them so we don't need to try and force it down their throats. It's like with beard care products, something that people don't really have, um, if they have never used it before, they won't just buy it and automatically use it every day. They haven't built a habit for it. It's not like brushing your teeth sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, if they stack up too much product, we'd rather them come back to us in six months when they're interested in it again and still be able to talk to them and continue like build this relationship with them. So they just go and buy it, go back on their subscription instead of just being like, oh man, I've got like so much beard products. These, you know, these guys keep shipping them. I like, I don't like it, you know? So, um, you absolutely have to do more than just, you know, switch a subscription on and hope it does well, unless you have a truly amazing, unique product, um, that people really need all the time. 
um, you know, and, and even at that, it's great to just kind of continually build those relationships. Yeah. When you say build the relationships, talk a little bit about how you actually go about that. Was like, I know I have a friend who's building a subscription uh, model right now. I'm in a really cool space, really cool CPG area that I think he's got a ton of potential in. Um, and I know that like the first like 30 people or so that have bought this subscription, he's called to, to do like a full sort of like talk with and say, Hey, I'm the founder and tell me about what you like about this. What were your hesitancies? Like how much in those early days is it important to literally like get on the phone and talk to your customers? I would say like incredibly, incredibly valuable. And like, he's just spot on with that strategy. It's something that we didn't do, but you know, like I said, a huge epiphany for us is when I actually talked to the guy and was like, Hey, like, why do you like us so much? And he told me exactly why. And it changed our business, right? So, you know, a lot of times you're not going to know how to build intimacy, intimacy at scale, um, or even like intimacy with individuals until you figure out, you know, how you accidentally did it or just experiment with things until it works. You can kind of, um, I think with relative certainty, guess what people in your niche or in your area of focus might like in terms of like content you can deliver them, um, you know, onboarding like material once they become a customer. Um, but you really kind of have to go out there and just continually be making tweaks and, you know, calling people and asking for feedback, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't and kind of cutting through the, you know, this barrier of people being on like this list of customers actually being real people and understanding what those real people want. So you can duplicate that. So I yeah. wish I could say there was a formula, but um, you know, the, the formula is to just con continually be experimenting and to be continually like have your ears open and not to try and um, deliver what you think people would want. It's to deliver what people actually want. And yeah, it's that interpretation of your product that was sort of like more real than your even you very real intentions that you had with the product. Like you're like, we want to build this authentic sort of experience around the fact that we love beers or whatever. And this, you call up this guy and he tells you that, no, I'm actually part of a fraternity. That's why I'm here. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Very, very cool. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about, cause I, you, you know, you guys, you gained so much momentum early on because of your videos. I actually, I think I probably have seen these videos. I, I should have watched them before the, uh, the interview here. I can't recall them instantly, but talk a little bit about like what goes into making a, a video that has the potential to go viral. Um, so, I mean, like this is a, something that we were getting asked all the time, especially when we were first, we had a couple of videos that were doing really well and going viral. Um, and then we like, I'm sure everybody that's watching this kind of felt the Facebook crunch where, you know, even to, you know, I think we have like 1.3 million likes on Facebook. We're lucky to get 10,000 views. If we post one on Facebook now, um, it like the math doesn't make sense. Um, but you know, really, um, I think again, what I would come back to is that kind of authenticity and tapping into something that people already kind of resonate with. And starting with with that as like a starting point of like, you know, what do people in my niche like, think is funny, or like shocking, or, um, you know, very emotional, and try and tap into those pre existing conditions with something that gets an emotional response. Um, and I think that's like a kind of a great starting point. Um, there is I was going to say that we have a, like Chris kind of put down uh, what, like he did a lot of the videos. So he kind of um, created this guide on what he was using. Like it's kind of like re reverse engineering our videos called proven P R O H V E N. Um, and we threw a mastermind event a couple of years ago. Actually, this is crazy. Like two years ago today, I think was the first oh, day nice. of it. Uh, <laughs> I didn't think of that, um, but it's unconsciouscontent.com. I think the, I think the PDF still should work. I haven't checked on it in a while, but, um, I can link it to you guys too, uh, if, if you want to include that in the comments or whatever. Um, but it basically just kind of breaks down like the different elements that we've used in our videos, like to get people's attention, then to like mention the product, to like build a connection and stuff like that. So there was a bit of like method to our madness, but we also realized that as we, as we went through the process and launched more and more videos that we were sort of creating this expectation that we could go viral with every video and it was not a sustainable path for us whatsoever and realize that you know it was sometimes better to create a video that doesn't go viral but that we could put facebook dollars behind and actually get pe get people's attention and then you know start them into a funnel so you know the first thing that i always say to people when they're like hey we want to create a viral video i'm like well that would be great if your your video goes viral but you should just focus on creating a great video that 
you know, mm-hmm. achieves specific outcomes like explaining your product or, you know, acquiring a customer or just kind of like getting people's attention. So you can start that conversation with that first video view and then retargeting them after that. So it was a lesson that we learned that, you know, going viral is not always the best intention to have. It's just a fabulous bonus if it happens. Yeah, because and that's going to lead potentially to the, that inauthentic sort of yeah. nature. And I think you guys experimented with that even. You guys went Absolutely. down the funnel. You started with a certain kind of video. And then in order to keep getting it, you had to push it further and further away from its yeah. initial value. And we've we've shot videos that cost, you know, $120,000 and that brought in, you know, not that much in revenue, like half as much in revenue. Like they were great for brand building. They were seen by a lot of people. So it's kind of hard to measure. But we had acquisition specific videos that were just for Facebook ads that we shot for like a thousand bucks that would bring in, you know, 200 grand in revenue uh, over a couple months. So we just sort of realized like our initial video before, like I think it brought in about, I would say two and a half million dollars that we can attribute to it. And it costs us 1800 bucks, you know, so like talk about that video for a sec. So what was, what were the elements that made that one such a success besides tapping into a a big wave? Like what, what was the the authenticity that, that really grabbed people there? Did it address a pain point that, that everyone shares with the beard or something? I think it like, it was just like, it was original in the beard market. Um, like no one had done something like that in the beard market about talking about like bearded guys. Like there had been, you know, your viral thread videos of like beards are really big right now. Do, 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 do. Uh, but yeah. no one had done something that was just like kind of like in your face, like we have a beard and like, you know, join the club and do this. So I think that just because it was so fresh, um, it was able to, you know, really connect with a lot of people. And, um, you know, I can't pretend for a second that we, didn't have you know this great company that started before us called Dollar Shave Club that did an extremely great job of explaining subscription e-commerce to a lot of people who didn't understand it before that. So being able to like people were like, oh, we get it. It's like that model, but you know, for people that don't shave, um, yeah. So that that how that you know them kind of breaking down those barriers like that. They, they were one of the I think like one of the best examples of subscription e-commerce like done right in a time when no one really understood subscription e-commerce. They were the pioneers in a lot of ways. And I really like that you guys took the, the flip side of the coin approach, you know, like if these guys are doing it on this for this, you know, societal trend, like the societal trend of not shaving is actually bigger or right now it is over the past several years has been. So it's like you take the same model, but the flip side of it in a sort of non-competitive space, it's, it's really, I just got my mind spinning about like other, you know, other things that are, that are out there right now that could kind of be flipped on their head and, uh, and subscribe to on the other side too. It's a uh, art. Right, so are you consistently like, what, what is, what is your time look like now? So are you still, how involved in the day to day at uh, the beard club are you? And then what are your main focuses? So I'm, I'm not involved really in hardly any of the day to day in beard club anymore. Uh, we hired an amazing executive team and even my business partner, Chris, um, has just had his first child two months ago, I believe. So he's taking some time off too. And we have just an amazing team that is crushing it on like profitability and acquisition and kind of gearing up for the next phases of Beard Club. Um, and I'm super passionate about helping other entrepreneurs as, as Beard Club is taking off. I got all these opportunities to speak and, you know, this why you and I ended up connected. So um, about six months ago, I said to Chris, um, you know, I really want to start pursuing other things. And I'd like to kind of take a step back from Beard Club and start helping other people. and um, you know, I don't know what I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Was kind of <laughs> the conversation went, and um, so lately I've been doing a number of different things in consulting and helping other companies. Um, I'm working on a coaching program for e-commerce companies. Um, I basically start to finish wrote um, a training course um, called Subscription Hacks, yeah, and it was kind it. of a it's brain good. a brain dump that of like everything that I've learned and wish I knew, kind of put it all into into one place. Um, that was very therapeutic. And then uh, this summer, I just took a little bit of time off. I got super burned out um, from, you know, years and years of, of pushing hard. And uh, my father passed away last fall. So like a lot of things kind of came to head all at the same time. And it's like, I really need to realign with my family and um, get some me time in. So um, yeah, it's, it's been a crazy last six months to one year. And um, but I'm, I'm, I'm loving it right now. I get to help a lot of different companies. And it's super rewarding helping people avoid the exact same mistakes that I fell into. It kind of adds value to them. Like, Hey, don't do this. Cause it, you know, we really screwed up. Um, so 
yeah, I'm still figuring that. I'm not sure if I will be starting my in a, like another e-commerce company of my own, or if I'd rather just kind of help other people. Um, there's just lots of opportunities to to help people out right now. So I'm just kind of fielding whatever's out there and just seeing what the universe brings to me and being grateful for it all. I like it. It must be an interesting position having had, you know, such a a nice success, a big a big. Well, you've had a few big wins now. It feels like, but you've had you've had this big the big big beard club win. Then being able to 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 actually systematize it to the point that you can kind of step away from it and then, and then sort of going into the wilderness a little bit as you're doing now, like this sort of soul searching journey that you're on. Do you feel yeah. a sense of anxiety about having to replicate the success of previous things or like, where Absolutely. are you? Cause I know as, as entrepreneurs, you're just a ball yeah. of anxiety, you know, yeah, I mean, never, even no matter how hard you're working, you're never working hard enough. Uh, you know, there's always things you could be doing here there. So how are yeah. you dealing with it now? I mean, to be honest, that was that was sort of what the step back was kind of needed. Like when I when I finished the course and kind of did a soft launch, I was just like, I was stressed out and I was completely burned out. And I had placed this completely unfair um, pressure on myself to have to have this business that does ten million dollars in its first year again. Like that is a very unrealistic goal, and I sort of got disconnected from that. I forgot what it was like to you know um, to not have this like you know momentum and stuff like that. Um, so. I really got identified with this idea like, hey, I don't really know what I want to do right now. And I'm not really sure what the next steps are and what that looks like. Meanwhile, like I'm committed to being an entrepreneur and that's all it is, is uncertainty. So I kind of like forgot this some for some reason in my mind. Um, and, you know, just really have for most of the the journey of the last four years have not really stayed fully present in it and just being like, hey, what is the end goal and where are we going? And, you know, over the last summer, I've had to reconnect with like, hey, you know, the end goal is constantly changing. Um, where you are right now is exactly where you're meant to be and everything is going to be okay. And, uh, you know, stop being so freaking hard on yourself. And I'm sure a lot of people watching this um, are really hard on themselves. It's sort of like an entrepreneurial thing and it's not really talked about a lot, but um, it causes a lot of anxiety and depression. And I've struggled with both of those things because of these expectations that I think other people have of me, which really are a projection of my own insecurities. So, um, it's it's really good to bring awareness to that and be able to you know take a deep breath and say like look buddy don't take yourself so seriously this yeah. is all a dream <laughs> it is I, it's gently floating down sometimes but this yeah. yeah it's it's again it's another club as well it's another this entrepreneurs club and it's funny because there's a lot of e-commerce brands built around uh, hustle and embracing the hustle and yeah. entrepreneurship as well but there's I don't know if there's many that are out there that are about this like mindful entrepreneurship this uh, you know, this club that we find ourselves in that our spouses may not fully understand or that yeah. our families may not fully understand the level, you know, to which your mind is sort of spinning all the time. Uh, and, and so to have a, to have a, this is the thing that I value so much about these events, about this Bangkok event we have Absolutely. coming up that we have planned in 2019. I was, was going to say that yeah. like the events are just like, you, you get the energy and the connection with, you know, I just can't wait to give you a hug in real life, man. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, and I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm just, yeah, I no. answer, like when you get that many entrepreneurs in a room together, or even if it's a smaller group of entrepreneurs, um, you're just like, cool, I can talk real talk right now. And I don't have to have a pissing competition with this person. I can be vulnerable and we can be like, Hey, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm trying to figure it out. And the other person's like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm trying to figure it out. And we're like, cool. We're just figuring it all out together. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. No, I, I, the events, you know, I, we're going to talk about them more uh, going forward, but, but events are, are the highest value thing that we do as an organization. Uh, and we're going to be putting a lot of effort into them and in, into the future. And, and Thailand, I, I, I just wrote this in an email today that's going out. It's actually a non sales email, one of my first. Uh, I'm telling the story about the three ways that like taking the plunge and flying to Bangkok has changed my life. It's happened to me three times now that I've, that I've just sort of on a whim gone to Bangkok, taken an opportunity. And it's and it's sort of transformed my life in all these different ways. And it's not like you're going to walk away from from the event of uh, e-commerce mastery live with a with a notebook filled with tips and tricks and hacks and things like that. But it's just almost like a it's almost more about like signaling to yourself that you're in it. You know that 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 yeah. you're in this community that you're part of this club. And then going there and you'll find every person that you talk to there is gonna gonna you know know what you've gone through and and want to yeah. find ways to work with you to help you in the future. Yeah, yeah, that's it's a tribe. That's what we we're talking about earlier, you know, like this is the the e-commerce entrepreneurship tribe and it's super important to be a part of something like that. Fantastic. Well, let's leave it there. But we I think we've owned this for our first live uh broadcast. We've had only a few people watching live. Thanks very much for for watching us live. I know a lot more will watch it 
um, at, at, in the replays and then when we post it on YouTube as well. If you want to come and figure out what's next with Eric, Alex, uh, and the whole group of e-commerce mastery live uh, speakers, both at our event, I I'll tell you about it too, Alex, we're also gonna be doing a mastermind dinner uh, that you'll be invited to obviously, because we wanna have all of our speakers there. Uh, and we are going to have a hell of a time as we always do at these events. So I wanna thank you so much for coming on the Robust Marketer first ever live episode, Alex. Uh, it was an uh, absolute pleasure. pleasure. Yeah, man, as I'm always. Just, I'm stoked for Thailand now, this is unbelievable. And you haven't been to Thailand, you were saying? This is gonna be my first time. I've been to Asia a couple of times, but uh, never to Thailand, so I'm it's really excited. It's a truly magical place. Make sure, you, make sure you make some time before or after to, to, to immerse yourself, because it's an unbelievable culture, it's so fun. I, I will definitely do that. <laughs> nice. Okay, thanks everyone. And uh, yeah, we, we'll, I'm gonna check the comment feeds on here. If you if you do watch this after the fact and you have any questions, Alex and I will both uh, you know check check the comments and answer any questions that you might have. As always, make sure you share this stuff. Make sure you tell your friends about it. If you see this on YouTube, make sure you follow us there. Um, it's gonna be another great season of The Robust Marketer. We're gonna interview all the speakers that we have in Bangkok who are some of the people that we've interviewed before. We're going to go back and, uh, and check in with them and talk about what's new. Uh, again, thanks, Alex. We will see you in Thailand. Yeah, we'll see you soon. Okay, cheers. Take care.